Hello, everybody. Welcome to Sonoma Land Trust Language of the Land series uh, with Margot Robbins tonight talking about cultural burning. We're really glad to have you here. The presentation is scheduled for about 45 minutes, which will be followed by 30 minutes of question and answer. And you can submit your question via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation or during the Q&A session. Sonoma Land Trust mission is to protect the natural lands of Sonoma County for everyone's benefit for now and in the future. And we are founded in 1976 and we've protected over 50,000 acres to date in Sonoma County. We're really pleased to have Margot Robbins here today from the Yurok tribe talking about their cultural burning practices. Margot is the co-founder and executive director of the Cultural Fire Management Council and she is one of the key planners and organizers of the Cultural Burn Training Exchange that takes place on the Yurok Reservation twice a year. She is also a co-lead and advisor for the Indigenous Peoples Burn Network. Margo comes from the traditional Yurok village of Morek and is an enrolled member of the Yurok tribe. She gathers and prepares traditional foods and medicine and is a basket weaver and a regalia maker. She is the Indian Education Director for the Klamath Trinity Joint Unified School District, a mom and a grandma. And we're really pleased to have her. This is gonna be an exciting evening. Margo. Thank you, Bob, for that introduction. I'm very happy to be here. I do come from a remote area and the, um, the internet is not that reliable. So at this point, I'm going to have to manechok, which means disappear but you will hear my voice. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm very happy to be here. So I am a Yurok tribal member. Our reservation is located along the Klamath River, starting where the Klamath joins the Trinity near there and it extends 32 miles to where the river enters the ocean. Our reservation is a mile on a, each side of the river, but our ancestral territory is much larger, half a million acres. As you can see, our territory is very beautiful, but also very steep and mountainous. We have been one of the fortunate tribes in that we were never removed from our homelands. We have inhabited this area for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of generations. And so we know and are connected to this place. We know how to take care of it. We have an intimate relationship with the environment around us and how to take care of it. And one of the primary tools that we use to take care of it is fire. In the beginning times before we as human beings lived in this area, there was a pre-human race of spirit beings, which we call Wage, that lived here. And they prepared the world as we know it. And it was those spirit beings that decided that they needed to have fire. They had heard that there was a place that, that there was fire and that it was warm and they could use it to cook their food and to make light. And so those pre-human race of spirit beings decided that they was gonna go and get it from the people in the sky. And so they made a plan and their plan was that they would one of the most powerful of them, Wapeka Mao, he would be the one to go up and actually take the fire from the old women that had it. And then he would pass it from one animal to the next. And you have to remember that in, in these times, the animals did not have physical form. They, they were in spirit form. And so they went up and they carried out their plan. And while Pekamel stole the fire while the old ladies was sleeping and he ran and ran, the old ladies woke up. They realized their fire was missing. They started chasing them. But just as he was ready to, uh, they were ready to catch him, he 
passed it off to the eagle and the eagle flew with it and passed it off to bear and, and bear passed it off to the mountain lion and so on and so on until finally they came to the river and frog took the fire into his mouth and he went underwater with it. And then he spit it out into the willows after the old ladies that were chasing him had gone away. So the pre-human race of spirit beings had everything that we as humans needed to live well on the land. And so we, when we arrived, some of them had taken physical form in the form of trees and rocks and the creeks and the river and the different plants and animals as we know them. But some of them stayed in spirit form, but before they left this plane of existence, they taught us what was good to eat, what was good to use as medicine, which plants we could use to make our our baskets, how to weave those baskets, and how to lift up prayer in a way that the creator wanted us to. And they also taught us how to use fire. And that fire was one of the elements that we were to use to take care of the, of the land and the plants and animals that lived here, not only physically, but spiritually as well. And so to this day, we hold that responsibility to the creation around us to take care of it physically and spiritually with fire. In thousands of years, they use fire from the highest mountains down to the levels of the ocean in order to, to keep balance in the land. Not, they wouldn't, every year they would burn but not every place. It was like a mosaic of different patch burning whenever the environmental cues would tell you that this place is ready to be burned. If it's a prairie, maybe the, the fir trees are starting to encroach on the prairie lands and so it's time to burn. Underneath that, the tan oak trees where we gather our acorns, when the acorns start to get a lot of bugs in them, it's time to burn. And so all of these different kinds of plants evolved with fire over time and are kept healthy and in their proper place by the use of fire. Next slide. We continue to use the knowledge that was passed down through the generations to us from our ancestors, but we live in a very different landscape today than what they lived in when they were using fire on a regular basis. Fire has been outlawed to the average person for over a hundred years. In Indian country, 120, 30 years ago, we were shot for trying to take care of the land with fire. We made a a law against it to where we would be imprisoned. And to this day, you can be imprisoned for starting an unauthorized fire. But we have learned to, to use fire within the policies and laws that have been laid out for us in our, in our homelands. And we have discovered ways to return fire to the land and to reclaim our right to use fire. It's a necessity that we do that because our culture is fire dependent. Without, cult without fire, our culture disappears. Some of the plants that we use are fire dependent. They need fire to reproduce and other plants benefit from fire. And so for the past seven years, the Cultural Fire Management Council, which is a nonprofit organization comprised primarily of Europe tribal members, but not exclusively, we have been returning fire to the land to restore it and make it healthy. Next slide. Our traditional food sources benefit greatly 
from from fire. You will see in this slide some of the some of the our traditional foods. We have in the top front a uh, big buck. Boy, would my son love to see that buck out there. So the deer need good habitat, and right now the way that our land is so crowded with brush, they were disappearing, you know, eight or 10 years ago, you would seldom see a deer when you drive up the road because nothing can live in that thick brush that has crowded our lands since the fire exclusion era. And so they were scarce. Since we have started burning, and have opened up some of the prairies and have greatly reduced the brush, we see a lot more deer in our territory. Our young men used to have to risk going off the reservation to hunt, but immediately come into those burned areas. The ashes are, are barely cool before they come in and roll in them to get rid of their ticks and fleas. And the following year, when the new growth comes up, all nutritious, they'll come back into those places. On the right hand side, you'll see my grandbaby. And he is sitting in a basket of acorns. So acorns for many, many tribes in California is one of the uh, food staples. It's kind of like rice or potatoes for people today or pasta. Uh, acorns is one of the primary food sources. Soon underneath of the tan oak trees, the acorns will become infested with weevils. Excuse me, somebody's at my door. Uh, yeah, I'm really busy, Carol. I'm on a Zoom meeting. Sorry. And so we need to burn under the tan oak trees every eight to 10 years in order to rid the acorns of the weevils. And if we burn at night, the moss that create those weevils, they'll fly down into the flames. So we're giving them a double whammy. Not only are, are we killing the ones on the ground, the larva, but also the, the moss that create those. And then the following year, we have a, a healthy acorn crop again. Typically underneath the tan oak trees, there will be growing huckleberries. And if the sun doesn't reach the huckleberries, they will not, um, they will actually stop producing. And because they need to have sun and, and, and also water and without not reach down into those, those understory trees. So again, it's important to, to burn underneath and to also keep the canopy open. Also, what grows underneath the tan oak trees is, is tan oak mushrooms, you'll see on the lower bottom. And they uh, grow up under, underneath the, uh, the leaves. Sometimes you'll see them poking up. And they're not dependent on fire, but they do like fire and are more productive with fire. Up on the top part, you'll see a young man pulling up a a fish out of a net. And you might wonder, what does that have to do with fire? He's in water. But there is actually a direct connection between fire and water. When we burn the, the brush off of the mountains, it increases the amount of water that reaches the creeks that then reach the river. We have some uh, large diversions on the on one of the primary tributaries to our river, and so our our salmon struggle to survive. That when the the water flow gets too low, they um, the the water gets too warm. In two thousand two, we had a massive fish kill because of poor water quality. So it's really important for us to do what we can to improve the water quality for the 
for the salmon and, and the eels and sturgeon and, and other uh, food sources that are in the river. So not only does putting fire on the ground reduce the amount of brush that's sucking up the water, but it also purifies the water. So if you stop and you think about what is in a water purifier, it's charcoal. And we are putting charcoal on the ground on a landscape level. And so it is purifying the water and as well as increasing it. Another uh, primary food source is the hazelnut that you will see in the middle of the, of the screen as well. And hazel is at one time was used if a mother's milk did not come in properly. And if she was unable to feed her baby with her own breast milk, they could pound this up and add water and it would sustain a child. And you know, you might think, well, that, that was all a long time ago and we certainly wouldn't use that today. But you know, we have come to find out with this pandemic that you can't necessarily rely on the grocery stores for the things that you need. And actually you don't have to because everything that you need to survive grows out in the forest. And as native people who are connected to our homelands, we take a personal responsibility for improving the health and viability and the balance of the forest and the plants and animals that live there. Next slide. There are other very important species out in the forest that we not only used in the past, but continue to use today. And that's the medicine plants. There is a plant that will fix anything and everything that could be wrong with you. On the upper left is um, dogwood. When the dogwoods bloom, we know that the sturgeon are in the river. And so our young men will put their, put their nets in right around April, right around now. But the bark of the, um, the dogwood is also good for your heart. Next to that, you'll see some beautiful rose hips, and rose hips are packed full of vitamin C, which is really useful if you are catching a cold. Next to those rose hips, you'll see uh, the wormwood. Wormwood is my one of my personal favorites. I like to make wormwood salve at, out of it. It's a traditional medicine that I uh, have um, have used more of a modern context to make it so that you can take it from place to place as a salve rather than having to boil up the leaves. But the wormwood is good for um, gout and rheumatism. It is good for sore muscles and poison oak, all kinds of things. So here you will just see a whole variety of different kinds of medicine plants that really benefit from fire. They're not dependent on it, but they do benefit from it. Next slide. Some of our basket materials are fire dependent. We are known as a basket weaving tribe. We use baskets from the time our children are born until, until the time a person passes on into that other realm of existence. We feed their spirit on a basket plate, which is then burned up. But you'll see in this centerpiece, the sticks coming out from that, from that basket start. And those are hazel sticks. And hazel has to be burned in order to render it useful for baskets. Because if you don't burn it, it's just a bush with a whole bunch of limbs and we can't use that. What we need is the straight shoots that grow straight up from the ground, which only occur when you burn the hazel. And so hazel is a fire dependent 
material that we must have in, in order to, to continue the tradition of basket weaving. There are some other types of plants that we could use, but they're not as strong as hazel. The need to have hazel for basket weavers was one of the primary reasons why we struck out on this journey to reclaim our right to use fire because we wanna continue carrying our babies in baby baskets. That's what our people have done for thousands of years. And it's important that we carry on that tradition. You'll see in the, in the bottom right-hand corner, a little baby tied into his little basket, all snug and secure. And they just love it. Some of them won't go to sleep unless, unless they're in their basket. And that has made all of Hazel, except for the wrap around the, around the edge, and that is uh, made with spruce roots. We also use baskets to cook with and eat with. You'll see on the left-hand side, a, a cooking basket. And this basket is woven so tightly that it will hold water as well as the eating baskets. And so we have put hot rock, uh, put rocks in the fire. And when they get red hot, we put them into this basket and stir it around with that paddle. You have to keep stirring it so it doesn't burn your basket. And it has to have uh, liquid in there so it doesn't uh, burn as well. So that is another critical use of baskets. In the lower uh, bottom middle, you'll see uh, an eel trap. And so you can see those big holes on the end. And the part that you see, it is a, um, it's a funnel. So the eels swim into there and then they can't find their way out. Up in the top left is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful baby basket. Um, excuse me, not a baby basket. It is a tobacco pouch. And it is the frame of this basket is made with with the hazel, and then the hazel is covered with, uh, you, you hold the sticks together with willow roots and it is covered with, um, there is the black is maidenhair fern, and the yellow is actually porcupine quills dyed with wolf moss. Now that, that maidenhair fern grows in wet places and it also benefits from fire because if we don't reduce the amount of growth on, on the hillsides, as I said earlier, it'll suck up all the water and the places that are supposed to be creeks will dry up and, and we won't have that beautiful black color. On the right hand side, the bat on the top is what we call an etgore. I don't really know that there's a, an English name for it. But this basket is used to send up prayer. It represents the family and it's used in the world renewal ceremony. And you'll see the black from the maiden hair fern. And you'll also see the white on it, which is bear grass. And again, bear grass must burn in order to render it. These things that are tied into our culture. And this is just a small sampling of the kinds of baskets we made. They're all dependent on fire. Next slide, please. So you see here in this picture, uh, one of our first burns. And in the foreground, you'll see the hazel bush. And it has, you can see all of its limbs on it. So when it's like this, we can't really, we can't use it for basketry at all. It will bear, um, some hazelnuts, which if humans or animals pick them, it will continue to bear them. But what happens is that without fire, these hazel bushes get so encroached on with brush that you can't even reach them to pick the hazelnuts. And so after a while, they stop producing. So this is a burn that the Cultural Fire Management Council did in cooperation with with some of our partners. And, and you can see the fire is just low, kind of creeping through the forest. And you might also notice that round kind of orb, that iridescent. And, and I, 
I think that that is one of the, the spirits of the forest. Other people will say that it's something on the lens of the, of the camera or this or that. But um, I know that, they, that each plant and each animal in the forest does have a spirit. And I think perhaps the camera caught this one as we are tending the forest in the way that we were meant to with fire. Next slide. So we have several strategies of returning fire to the land. One of them is a, is a traditional method of burning, which is families taking care of their own hunting and gathering areas and around their homes. Traditionally, we never burned as a, as a fire prevention method that we burned the land different places at different times for different purposes, whether it's for hazel sticks or acorns or hunting grounds. And wildfire prevention was a byproduct of that land management strategy. And so we continue to, to use those, those ancient ways of, of burning but in a modern context. You'll see here on the left, my daughter with her baby and she is uh, doing a, uh, helping with a small family burn and she's using a drip torch because in this day and age, that's a handy, easy way to um, light a, a fire and, and keep it going to carry the fire along. And um, so we have taken traditional ways of burning and incorporated modern methods to, um, to get the result done. On the right hand side, you will see three generations of fire practitioners. And um, you look at that little guy on, the, on his mama's back and he's just looking around her, looking at that fire being lit. So, in bringing back family burns, it is very, very important to start teaching kids at a, at a young age how to use fire in a good way to make sure that you're doing it in a safe way and why it's important to use fire. So these are my grandkids and my daughter and, and my sister, and uh, they are burning a small little uh, briar patch on the on part of the property by my house and the first thing that we talked taught the kids as we before we started to burn is that you always start a burn at the top of the slope because that way the fire just slowly backs down the hill and it stays under control so what you see here is the top has already been burnt and the kids have not now gone down, gone down to the bottom of the burn with their wormwood torches and they are lighting this little briar patch from the bottom. And then on the, on the bottom picture, this is my grandson. He's only like two and a half years old learning how to burn with this auntie. So it's never, they're never too young to start learning about, about the benefits of fire and, and how to do it safely. After we finished this little burn, I, I asked the kids, well, what did you learn? And they was kind of quiet for a while. And I said, um, well, when do you burn? And they said, when you're with an adult. And I said, that's right, you got to have an adult to make sure you're safe. And I asked them, and, and where do you start? And they said, at the top. And I was so happy because if they didn't remember anything else, I wanted them to be sure to remember that they start at the top of the slope because that's what keeps the fire under control. And so my grandkids, as well as other people's kids and grandkids have joined in this effort to, to bring fire back, back to the land as, as small family burns and to do it in a, in a safe way. 
the Cultural Fire Management Council in, in supporting this effort offers a community um, burn class. It's a one day class in how to, um, how to reintroduce fire to the land in these changed circumstances that we live in with climate change and, and with brush overgrown everything that we can't go out and just burn at the right place at the right time the way our ancestors did. We need to prepare the land to accept fire in a good way so that it doesn't escape. And part of that preparing the land is often almost always uh, includes putting a fire line around it. And of course, you should always have, have water handy when you're working with fire. And so the Cultural Fire Management Council has a cache of tools that we loan out to, um, to families to prepare their land to accept fire. And we also will uh, go and help them put a fire line around it. And then on the day that they want to actually um, light it up, we'll have a little, we call it a slip-on engine, but basically it's a tank of 300 gallons of water with a pump that will squirt it at high pressure that we put onto the back of a truck. And so we bring that so that families will have an added measure of safety by having water on site. Next slide. So another uh, way strategy that we have used to uh, return fire to the land is cooperative burns. And this is um, a cooperation between the Cultural Fire Management Council and in this instance, the Yurok tribe. And we are, um, we are safeguarding an elder's home from wildfire. We have already burned up on the back side of this house and we have burn, started the burn at the top of this slope and now we have come down to the bottom. So the Europe Wildland Fire has a crew of about six people on their crew and they have uh, cultural fire management. Um, it's the black truck and you can see that little slip on engine in the back. You can see the holes rolled up there. And so we have about 11 people. So this burn was con conducted with about, um, I think there was about 15 people there that day to conduct this burn and we had uh, two two fire engines, and then we had a, a tank that uh, holds water that we can pump out of there. And so we were, um, as I said, safeguarding this home against, uh, against wildfire. In our country, um, this road that you see is the single road that goes onto and off of the reservation. It's not even wide enough to have a, a line down the middle. And most of the fires that start are started from this highway and go up the hill. So we have been focusing our efforts on reducing the fuels above, above this road. The elders who, um, who live in the houses up above, they was just totally comfortable with having us burn all, all around their house because they know that we know what we're doing. We have not only the experience, but we have the uh, qualifications of, of actual firefighters. As Cultural Fire Management Council members, we don't fight fire, we light fire, but we do have firefighter qualifications. Next slide. The third way that we have been successful in returning fire to the land is a cultural burn training exchange. And this is for qualified firefighters. It's conducted as a training. We have all levels of firefighters from brand new, um, we call them FFT2s, but they have the minimal level of, of firefighter qualifications all the way up to burn boss and incident command. Uh, we have qualified engine bosses and holding bosses and everything, 
all the different levels of firefighters. And they come from all across the United States for a couple of reasons. One is that it's a training and so they can increase their uh, level of qualifications, which of course would mean a pay raise for them. Another reason is that they get to learn about prescribed burning or applying fire to the land in a purposeful way. Most of them is all they ever do is, is fight fire. It's not often that they get the opportunity to experience uh, prescribed burns. So a prescribed burn means that you have a, a, a specific set of instructions that you need to follow in order to burn. It's kind of like if you go to a doctor and they give you a prescription to treat some body ailment. Well, a prescribed burn is a prescription to treat our ailing land, to bring it back to health. And the prescription called the burn plan says how many people that you have to have on the fire, how much equipment you have to have there, how hot the day can be, how wet or dry, how hard the wind can blow, all of these different things, it, out, it outlines what you need to follow. And so we have cultural burn training exchanges twice a year, and, and we have about Typically about 35 firefighters come and they stay for seven or eight or 10 days. We, uh, they camp out near the incident command post. We provide food for them because we are in a really remote area. There's like one tiny grocery store and, and no restaurants. And while they're here, we teach them something about our culture because we want them to know that what they are doing is much more than just burning brush. Like typically people do uh, fuel reduction prescribed burns or primary, their primary reason is to reduce the amount of brush, which is good because the brush does need to be reduced because it's contributing to the spread and intensity of wildfires. And we're also doing that but in addition to a reducing that fuel load, our primary purpose is to increase the health and availability of culturally important species. So we're doing it with, with qualified firefighters, but we're teaching them about the different plants and animals that are living on this land that they are improving the conditions for. So when we walk a unit and look at it before we burn it, we're pointing out which plants are good for baskets, which plants are medicine, so that they understand that what they're doing is something much bigger than just burning brush, that what they are doing, in fact, enables us to continue our cultural life ways, not just for this generation, but for generations to come. Next slide. So this is a picture of a pre-burn area. And you can see that the, um, the growth is very thick. You can't see through it. And this is actually sort of uh, one of the areas that isn't as thick with brush as most of the areas are. Uh, you'll see the hazel in the foreground and uh, uh, um, a drone tree on the left, a fir on the right. If you don't burn at a regular intervals, the fir trees will encroach on everything. This area that you see right here is supposed to be oak woodland savanna. It's supposed to be like one of those open areas with grass and, and um, scattered oak trees about very different from this picture that you are seeing here. The brush is so thick, you cannot see through it, you can't walk through it, and it is not really a very hospitable environment for any of the larger animals such as deer. Next slide. This is a post burn photo. 
And as you can see, the brush is all gone. The trees are intact. They haven't really been harmed. You'll see all of this charred um, <clears throat> limbs laying on the ground. When we are doing landscape level burns, we're leaving biochar on the ground. Very, very important. You can see the new growth coming up, all healthy. This is only like two and a half, three months after a burn, and this is already coming back. Once again, we started at the top of this slope, backed the fire down the hill so that the flames didn't get too high. This was conducted as, as a Trex burn. Next slide. With all the wildfires that have been going on, people have really just, just been focusing on that. And they forget, or perhaps they never knew, that fire is about new life. It purifies. And when the spring comes around, grass, birds, everything is real, enjoyable, new and fresh. The deer, elk, and all wildlife come to the burned areas. This is a quote from Al Tom Wilson. He was a co-founder of the Cultural Fire Management Council and unfortunately is, is no longer with us. But he was the one that had the vision, that originally had the vision to restore our land with fire because the land needs fire. It's meant to be part of the ecosystem and it's up to all of us to work together to return fire to the land. Next slide. The nonprofit, such as the Cultural Fire Management Council, the for profits, the tribes, Cal Fire, Forest Service, BLM, private landowners. We all need to work together to restore the land to a healthy environment. It is possible. Thank you. And I am now open for questions. Wow, that was great. Thank you, Margot. That was really, that was fascinating. Um, we are going to go into a, a question and answer period now. And um, I just want to, be, before we get there, I just want to thank Margot for that presentation. I want to thank everyone here on the, on the uh, Zoom for, for joining us. And um, feel free to stick around for another half an hour for, for Q&A. If you need to go, I'd like you to, um, to remember to keep engaged with Sonoma Land Trust by following our various social media accounts and visiting our website. Um, attendees can view past presentations and download educational materials on our Nature at Home page on our website. And keep an eye out for future webinars. The next one is scheduled for April 22nd. And again, you can find that information at sonomalandtrust.org. As you know, Sonoma Land Trust is a nonprofit organization which means we rely on donations from individuals, businesses, and foundations from people like you to make our work possible. If you like what you heard today, please consider donating. Your gift helps support land protection and preservation. Uh, to make a donation online to Sonoma Land Trust, visit sonomalandtrust.org and click the donate button. Thank you so much. In these uncertain times, we really appreciate everyone who's supporting our work. As we move into our Q&A period here, you can submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your, 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 um, your screen there. So let's see, I will be asking Margo the questions. And let's see. So Janice asks, I have a question for the host before we get started. I know the Native Americans had a way of burning grass for environmental reasons. Why didn't it come? Why didn't incoming settlers that took over their lands change the way it was done, which was much safer then?
Is that question for me? Yes, Margo, I'm sorry, that question's for you. Oh, I was thinking you was the host and it was uh. for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't know why the settlers that came in and, um, and replaced Indians on their land, why they didn't con continue to use it. Very possibly because where they came from, fire was not used as a tool to take care of the land. I was recently speaking with a lady uh, from England and I asked her, I said, well, didn't you guys used to use fire to take care of your land? If you know you come from an agricultural society and and um, fire makes the soil healthier, and she said no. As far as she knows, none of them ever used fire. So probably because they come from a place that did not use fire as a land management tool, they didn't understand how important um, it is to to keep land healthy, at, at least in this place to use fire. I think they were fearful of fire. In fact, that was why they made laws against um, Native people being able to use um, fire is because they were afraid of it. What you don't know, you tend to be afraid of. And so uh, that was probably one of the reasons. Um, and, you know, I can't help but think in the back of my mind that um, that there was a big push to wipe us out our identity as Indian people that tried to take away our cultural identity in boarding schools. We weren't allowed to you know, speak our language or do any of those things that we would traditionally do. And so because our culture is based on fire on the land, perhaps it was another one of those genocidal acts mm. to to wipe us out our native identity. Well, oh, thank you. That was, um, thank you for that. We have a bunch of questions about the more technical aspects of burning. Um, how, do you, how do you do burns on steep ground in ways that don't lead to excessive runoff of earth or mud when the rainy season comes? So one of um, the times that we burn is in fall, right before the rainy season. And we have not had a problem with a lot of um, mud and things like that uh, washing down. And primarily because when we're burning, we're not burning up the trees. And so the root systems from the trees are still what we are burning is getting rid of is all the brush so the the root systems of the trees are effective in in holding the soil in place plus within about a month and a half things start to grow back okay and let's see um what size of area is best to burn at one time? What size? Yeah, how big an area is best to burn at one time? So it depends on, on where you're burning. People that live on uh, grassland, they can burn a couple thousand acres in a day because it's, um, you know, it tends to be a lot flatter and it's not, uh, it doesn't, have as much uh, brushy growth on it. For us in this steep territory that we live in that's choked out with brush, I think the most we've been able to burn in a day is about maybe 45 acres. Oh, okay. And we're trying to increase the, uh, the scale, but it's hard because it is so brushy and it is so steep and you have to be extra careful, you know, about how you do it so that it doesn't escape. You know, there's a number of questions we're getting about people interested in scale. How can we scale these practices? 
what is the best way to scale up cultural burning and how can the public help assist in this? Right, so um, I think that we are all looking for ways to increase the pace and scale. And one of the big prohibiting factors is the, um, the environmental documents that we're required to have before we can burn the, um, the state and federal, they call them CEQA and NEPA, environmental compliance documents. And um, it's really, really costly for us to have to um, do one of those and time consuming. It takes like over a year to have one approved. And so it would make it so much easier if because we are working on our own ancestral territory, if the tribe itself could just approve it. And who knows our land better than the tribe? We should not have to go to state and federal agencies for those environmental approvals. Our tribes should be able to, to do, do the whole approval process, in my opinion. Um, another thing that is, um, is, makes it difficult is the burn season. So Cal Fire has a certain season when fire is restricted, and that is from uh, May 1st through sometime in October. And during that time, you, you have to have a, a permit from them. But sometimes that's, that's during like the fire season, although now the fire, the wildfire season tends to go year round. But sometimes it's really, really hard to get a permit from them if there's say a fire down south and then so their resources are down south mm -hmm. and up here it's a prime time for us to burn but we can't get a permit because they don't have backup resources the reality of it is is that when we're doing our trex burns we have over a hundred people up here and and 12 or or more fire engines, and we have more than enough contingency resources that should a fire escape, we could take care of it with our neighbors for help. And so one, one thing that would help up the pace and scale is that we're allowed to use more of those contingency resources instead of Cal Fire thinking that they're the only ones that could act as a contingency. You know, I know that they try really hard to accommodate our request for permits because they realize the need for more prescribed burns as well, and it puts them in, in kind of a predicament. But, you know, we have to find a solution, and I, I feel like that's one of these solutions. Um, there is, of course, the uh, prohibiting factor of enough money because it, it, it costs a lot less money to do prescribed burns than to fight fire, but there's way less money allocated for it because they're used to using most of it to fight fire, which is in the billions, you know, for a 10th of that amount of money, mm -hmm. we could up the pace and scale of, of the prescribed burns. So it's a matter of priorities. You know, will we do our fire prevention now and put some money into prevention or will we wait and spend the billions on trying to fight fire? You know, you can't fight fire. You're not going to win. It's like trying to fight the rain. That's, yeah. So we're, one of the, you know, there's, a, gosh, the questions are good. And so there's some, some threads here about the difference between your cultural burning and some of the destructive wildfires we've seen in the past, you know, five, 10 years here in Northern California. How are they different? And, and are there any stories or legends about big destructive fires? And um, what do they say about what caused those and how to heal them? So, there is a huge difference between wildfires and cultural burns. 
um, a wildfire is out of by an accident. Mm -hmm. And uh, a cultural burn is a purposeful burn in a, in a specific place by people that are connected to that place. It's a place-based burn that has to do with restoring the land and creating balance physically and spiritually. And it has to do with the people who come from there, not only having that intimate connection with place, but also knowing the factors that affect fire. Like you can tell when a storm is coming or you know which way the wind is gonna blow and which, when about what time of the day it's gonna change direction. And you know the lay of the land and how the wind re interacts with the lay of the land because the fire reacts to these different kinds of things. And so um, it is that intimate connection and the purpose for the burn and who's doing the burn that makes it a, a cultural burn. Um, I haven't really heard of any, any um, catastrophic wildfires pre-European contact. Um, of course, there may have been. There's a lot I haven't heard about. Um, so I can't really answer that question, the rest of that question. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, so with, with climate change, and we're seeing our the temperatures rising, we're seeing the fire season, the dry season extend longer. Um, how is that? Does that interact with um, your own practice of cultural burning in terms of timing and um, when a good time of the year to burn is? It's always a good time of year to burn someplace. It's just a matter of um, if you can get a permit to do it. There are some places in our territory, we are, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, our reservation runs from, from the mouth of the river up 32 miles along the river. So we're affected by the coast weather. And there are some areas in our, um, our homelands that will only burn during the hot, dry season. Otherwise, it, uh, it doesn't get enough sun in there and, and the duff and leaves doesn't have a chance to dry out and carry fire. And so traditionally, we burned all times of the year, you know, it could be that uh, that time when, you know, a, a storm is coming in during the summer. And so you start knowing that by evening that that rain will come in and put out the fire. It could be when you get those uh, some good days in, in winter where the sun comes out for four or five days and the nights are cold and so you can burn during the winter. It's always a good time to burn someplace. Climate change has affected the way we do fire in that um, it's really affected the seasons. You know, even the plants don't know what seasons it is, what season it is. The flowers will start blooming in winter because they think it's spring, you know? And so um, there's no set time to do things according to the seasons anymore because the seasons are so mixed up. So you have to pay attention to other kinds of cues about when it's time to burn, you know, according to where the plants are in their growth cycle or what the weather is like. And the, um, the climate change has also affected how, um, how dry the uh, fuel is, the, the woody debris, and so which controls how hot the fire might burn. Mm -hmm. And so climate change has definitely uh, made a difference in, in how and when, when you can burn. It has also uh, made a difference in how big these uh, wildfires are getting. Um, mm -hmm. They are really getting out of control because things are so dry. And then when it burns up the forest, we have uh, we have um, 
that effect that affects climate change as well all of that smoke going up into the air and a lot less trees to clean the air so it's had a big effect on on the use of fire do you think your cultural burning practices um reduce wildfires absolutely it does Anytime you reduce the amount of fuel on the land, you are uh, reducing the spread and intensity of wildfire. So, and especially when you're doing larger areas, you know, you're burning a whole drainage. And so um, that, that fuel reduction, when if a wildfire reaches that, it needs fuel to, to continue to build. So when it hits these places where the fuel has already been burnt, it drops down enough that firefighters can get a hold on it and put it out. So it reduces the spread. We have, um, are you still, you're, you're answering these questions wonderfully. You're just a, a wealth of knowledge and we really appreciate you uh, sharing everything in, in, with us. Um, we have a lot of questions. People are interested about some of your, your, your training, for example. Would you consider holding a cultural burn training exchange um, for land stewards and landscape conservancies and land trusts, et cetera, and things like, is there an opportunity to partner there So um, our training exchanges are open to everybody. You do have to have your basic in entry level, level firefighter qualifications in order to participate, um, but they're not that difficult to get. When we first uh, started training our community, we uh, had a burn boss come in and do a class it was a week long class that he taught. And then at the end of the class, you're, uh, you have to go out and learn how to scrape a fire line and you need to learn how to get into a fire shelter. And so that's one way to do it. But you can also do classes online. It's called basic 32 classes. And it takes about, they call them basic 32, but it takes about 40 hours to do them. And then when people show up for the, uh, the Trex burn, then we have them, um, you know, we have them clean up some of the fire lines so they know how to scrape a line and we have them do the fire shelter and then they're qualified to, to be part of the burn. Um, and so that's open to everybody. I can uh, type my um, email into the chat box for people who are interested in, in coming to uh, Trexburn. And they might also just um, Google Trexburns because there's a lot that um, are happening in California and other states as well. It's, uh, it's turning into a really big thing. It is the brainchild of the Nature Conservancy, Jeremy Bailey, United States. Um, are you, is the Yurok tribe able to work with other private landowners? We have someone who lives in the Mark West watershed down here in near Santa Rosa, and they're interested in how they could apply some of the practices you've been talking about on their own land. Right. So, um, well, first I would like to say that um, the Cultural Fire Management Council is not actually part of the formal tribal structure. We are composed primarily of tribal members, but we're not, and we do work in collaboration with the tribe, but we're not part of the formal tribal structure. Um, so there are a lot of people that are interested in learning how to burn um, their lands. And in fact, the um, CAL FIRE is just starting to roll out a, a California Burn Boss Trainee Program for landowners. But the kicker is that you have to um, have experience with fire. In the process of developing a program to train landowners, that we would have uh, some specific trainings for landowners to come and participate and burn with us. And then we would then go to their land 
to help them do a, a burn on their land. Mm -hmm. It's in the beginning stages. It's going to take a while for us to um, develop, but it is in the plans. Well, that's really interesting. Um, does do the folks that you work with, or the Yurok tribe, or other tribes, work with carbon credits to fund some of your 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 fire program? Our tribe does uh, get carbon credit uh, money and did actually give us a hundred thousand dollar grant out of that um, carbon credit money to um, to work on uh, projects with them. Um, and it's very very interesting because at first. Um, when we uh, was wanting to burn some of the tribal land because if we burn private land as we're burning tribal land, or private land is not a problem. We just have them sign a waiver. And, um, but the place that we wanted to burn on, on tribal land was, was right below one of their carbon credit stands. And they did not, we told them that, you know, if you don't let us burn it, it's very likely that a fire could start and burn up your whole carbon credit project. That's right. up the hill from, from here, that it's in your best interest to allow us to safeguard your car, carbon credit um, trees by reducing the amount of brush that's below it and even reducing the amount of brush in the carbon credit um, place, because when you burn that brush, you're reducing the competition for food and water for your big trees. So they're mm -hmm. growing bigger and, and producing more carbon. Um, Jared asks, he says, hello, Margo. Um, how do you feel about selective logging, especially after wildfire? Do you think that selective logging has a place alongside cultural burning? since things are so out of balance. Is this Jared Childress? Yeah. Hi, Jared. <laughs> he came up here and burned with us and then we went down there too. Um, so yes, actually, I do think that uh, select logging has a place that, you know, some a lot of times when you look at our forests and like the trees are all crowded together. They're like six inches apart and four inches in diameter. And, and that's what we're calling our forests now. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. So there's a couple of, of problems with that. One is that why are they replanting trees so close together for one? And why aren't they thinning them out when they're growing so close together? And so I think that um, in cases like that, where they're all crowded up, that yes, a lot of them should be taken out. And then there's also this thing about, which I'm sure many people might disagree with me, but you know, trees have a specific lifetime and they get ripe and start to die. And when you see those big growths on the trees, that means that they're starting to die. And so I feel like it would be all right to harvest them when they're at that stage. Thank you. Um, Nancy asked- Selectively. Oops, I'm sorry. I said selectively. <laughs> yeah, that's the key word, right? Right. So Nancy asks, if this knowledge that you've been sharing with us is available to children and teachers for California schools, um, she's, um, do you have any ideas how, what she could suggest to her teacher friend in Oakland? They were discussing the wildfires um, and also the, uh, the Native American knowledge about cultural burning and wondering how they could share that. So, um, the Karuk tribe has put out some really amazing curriculum that I had the opportunity to, um, to be part of. And um, I, I, I'm 
willing to talk with them about the possibility of, of putting it out to a bigger audience of people, but it teaches, um, it doesn't teach about wildfire. It teaches about prescribed burning mm -hmm. and it teaches about the different fuel types. So there's fine fuels, which are like, there's one hour fuels, which is like your pinky and 10 hour fuels, which is your thumb and hundred hours. So it teaches you the different kinds of fuels. It teaches you about the different um, slopes of the land and how thick the trees grow on it and how that affects fire and its behavior. And um, so, after doing these, and then there's also some videos about cultural burning and, and um, you know, the purpose of using fire on the land. So it teaches you the need for putting fire on the land. And then it teaches you about these different things that affect fire. And then after that, we have these little matchstick forest experiments, which are awesome and amazing. So you take these little 10 by 12 tins and they have little dough in the bottom and you put unlit lit matchsticks in them. And some have a lot of matchsticks, like a whole bunch, and some are more sparse. And then the um, kids predict what's going to happen depending on you know how many matchsticks are there or if it's flat land meaning your tin is laying flat or if it's at a slope or if you start the fire at the top or if you start the fire at the bottom and then so they do these experiments where they will light it from the top and, and then count how many matchsticks burn and how long it takes for the fire to go out. And then they will um, light it from the bottom and watch the fire swoosh up and burn everything up. And, and so it is this really amazing curriculum. And then they get to build their own little landscapes. And so there is some really good curriculum out there. Also, the U.S. Forest Service put out this great little color book for younger kids that talks about prescribed burns. And I sent that out to, um, to our, uh, our students in our school district. I also uh, wrote a small book about prescribed burns that has some curriculum with it for like sixth graders or something like that that will be making available. Thank you. You've been um, sharing uh, here. You've been talking about the Karuk tribe. Are there other tribes or and tribal entities in California practicing cultural burning techniques similar to you or in similar kinds of programs as the as the Yurok? Uh, yeah, um, the Karuk has been doing that for a long time, longer than us, at um, Shingle Springs is um, doing burning. And there's, oh, the um, Ron Good, um, he is, I think he's Miwok. I don't know, my memory's not the greatest, but there are some other cultural groups that are doing it as well. And Jared might remember better than me. <laughs> <laughs> Someone asks, so in Sonoma, many of the intensively managed landscapes are rangelands or forests that were historically managed um, or timber or grazed. And we're having a challenge managing chaparral uh, scrub landscapes. Do you have any suggestions for cultural burning in, in chaparral? You know, I don't really know anything about uh, chaparral. That you'd have to get that knowledge from tribal people that live in um, in where their homelands have chaparral. We don't have that up here, so I can't really answer that question. Okay, thank you. There's um some folks that are asking, um, are there places to donate or specific ways that we could help advocate to our elected officials? to um, help you in your cultural born, burn work and to support your tribes in generally in these activities. And similarly, someone asks, what can we do to help um, have wider spread use of prescribed burning um, in California? 
Right. So there is some legislation um, that has just recently been introduced. One is by Friedman and the other is, um, oh gosh, I can't remember who introduced the other one, but it has to do with, um, with gross um, negligence liability. Mm -hmm. So liability mm -hmm. is a huge prohibited factor in, in up in the pace and scale of, um, of burning. In fact, um, people who used to have fire insurance, their, their insurance companies have dropped them. So it's like virtually impossible to get insurance to burn. Um, so, so that would be one way to, um, to impact that is those two legislations. Um, what was the rest of your question? In general, oh, how, yeah. how can they help? Yeah. So of course, donations are always, um, always helpful, especially when we are uh, doing our, um, our family burns that we have, you know, we received a grant from Cal Fire to do our big uh, landscape level burns, but the smaller family burns also need support. And we have a, um, a Facebook page mm -hmm. um, that can, uh, you can make donations. Um, in terms of the tribe, um, I can't really speak for the tribe, I can speak for the Cultural Fire Management Council and myself as a tribal okay. member. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. So some folks are interested in how, in general, they can learn more about uh, Yurok or other Native American traditions and practices in person. Um, that is a really Good question. The um, my um, friend and sister in fire, Elizabeth the Zoos, and uh, our fire coordinator, Rick O'Rourke, we have been doing a lot of um, presentations similar to this one that I've done um, this evening. And you can um, just Google cultural fire and you'll probably find us. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of um, movies out, Wilder Than Wild and Face, mm -hmm. Facing Fire. Um, the, the Karuk tribe is a really good source to look up cultural management practices. They have a lot of good stuff out on YouTube as well. Um, so that would be my, my primary um, suggestions for people to learn because you know there's only a limited number of people that we can personally bring out here and <laughs> and give yeah. insight you know teach sure. teach about it mm -hmm. and and hardly any not actually any now that we're in covid we're doing getting ready gearing up for a burn and it's all local people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's changed a lot um, someone asks whether the Yurok's were, are involved in advocating for the upcoming removal of dams in the Klamath. Oh, absolutely. The Yurok's have been uh, instrumental in, in making that happen. They've been, been fighting for it for years and years and years and years. And um, it is a huge victory that everybody is finally in agreement, including the dam owner that yes, they're gonna come down. So we anxiously await that day. That's uh, pretty exciting. It's getting closer. Yeah, yeah. So we have just a couple more things. So one is um, Roberta and Jim say to you, Margo, we don't have a question for you, but we wanna thank you for your wonderful presentation. And they hope that you'll continue to share your incredible wisdom with us. And I think they're speaking for all of us that are able to enjoy this uh, this talk with you tonight. Thank you so much. And then someone asked- I how appreciate all these great questions. You, you, I mean, you I'm, I'm really impressed with the way you're, you're able to fire off 
such articulate and complete answers to them, um, you're an amazing <laughs> repository of information. This is because um, we're giving you a workout. I think we've you've asked 40 or 50 questions now. So um, holy smokes. Yeah, we're working you out. Someone has asked us whether Sonoma Land Trust sees themselves working or partnering with tribes to work together to utilize prescribed fire. And I guess I'll, I'll answer that because you probably don't know the answer to that question. And um, Sonoma Land Trust in, in, in the way that we're managing our lands, we are really focusing on changing the way the fire moves across the landscape. You know, the approach is um, I think in, in spirit is, is similar to much of what you've been sharing about your cultural practices. And as we move towards getting our land ready for prescribed fire, um, my answer is we're very much interested in working with, understanding, partnering, being respectful to our local native tribes that have been on the landscape for far longer than we have. So um, we are reaching out to folks like the Kashaya and the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria and others, um, hoping to establish relationships where we can uh, learn from each other and from our, our, our individual histories on the land. So- Have you Margo, been successful in making that connection, Bob? What's that, I'm sorry? I, I was wondering if you've been successful in making that connection with uh, tribes in regard to collaborating on, on the fire regime there. Um, we're just starting the, um, we have great relationships, I think, with the Kashaya Pomo and with the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria and some initial relationships with the, with the Wapo tribe in the eastern part of the county. And we're just now starting to talk about fire. We've been working with them on other things on the lands um, where we have intersections between our ownership and, and traditional and historical and you know, Native American use and, 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 and uh, functions on the, on the land. But we're, we're going to be moving into that arena shortly as we are starting to strive for fire, uh, returning fire to our land. Not only, to, to be honest, not only to seek um, help in, in how, what their understanding of the best practices are, but we also want to protect the cultural, land, cultural resources that are already on the land. And um, we, we're seeking input on, on how to protect the, the cultural sites because Sonoma County is very rich with, with Native American um, ancestral sites. I, I think that a lot of times people think that in order to protect some, um, need to uh, like put this, burn, not burn it, but mm -hmm. really the land evolved with, evolved with fire and mm -hmm. needs fire so if you want to protect and enhance it it most often needs to be burned <laughs> yep that sounds um the direction that a lot of folks want to go margo thank you so very very much for your time and your your generosity and sharing um your stories and your information and your experience with fire this has been fascinating and um and i, I just can't thank you enough well, thank you so much. And I'm very happy to um, have been able to be a part of this. Us too, thank you. <laughs>